Welcome back to Men and the City. In today's video, I want to talk about investing. So today's video is going to be called Surviving the Age of Scarcity. Now, over the last several years, there have been amazing, meteoric, speculative manias in financial markets, as there always are, but especially so since the onset of COVID in 2020. And most recently, for those of you who are somewhat attentive to what happens in cryptocurrencies, there were exchange-traded funds, ETFs, finally authorized by the Securities and Exchange Commission to trade in Bitcoin. So th th these are fairly monumental moments that are changing financial markets in profound ways. So I thought today we could talk a little bit about some ground rules for how to hedge against potential turmoil. And I am of the mindset, and I, I, I'm cer certainly not alone, although I think I'm in the minority camp, that we are in the throes of a kind of financial crisis and an economic catastrophe, the likes of which we have not seen for almost 100 years. Uh, the last time the world saw anything like this was, was the Great Depression. And I think indeed we are going into a depressive-like episode. It's hard to say at this stage how bad it will be, but I think it could be quite bad indeed. So given that context, how do we deal with these things? Well, I, I wanted to say right off the bat a couple things. I live by a principle and have for the better part of my adult life and, and certainly my investing career, which is not all that long, to be clear. But my great-grandfather, who lived through the Great Depression, said, I, I think very succinctly, that we are only ever one major event away from a Great Depression. And I think that that is a very apt statement. People, over long periods of time, forget history. They forget the hard times. They tend to look back with nostalgia on the good times. This is true in your life. It's true in relationships. And it's certainly true in financial markets. There's a famous quote or a relatively well-known book, I should say, called A Short History of Financial Euphoria, written by an economist named John Kenneth Galbraith. And he put it well. He said, there can be few fields of human endeavor in which history counts for so little as in the world of finance. Markets are persistently volatile. They are unpredictable. They are chaotic, as is human nature. And remember that the agents of financial markets are human beings. So try predicting the outcomes of your children or your family members or your cousins' lives. And that's sort of like predicting what financial markets are going to do. Okay, so if we accept the, the premise of what I'm saying, which is that disaster can happen at any time, and that we are in fairly unique circumstances within a broader 100-year cycle, these are the, the basic governing principles or ground rule, rules that I have followed. This is not financial advice, but hopefully it is some degree of financial insight. The first is that investing is not about offense, it is about defense. Investing for most people is about greed. It's about hearsay, it's about mania, it's about speculation, it's about getting rich quickly. But that's not what investing should be about. Investing is about protecting your wealth and hopefully, if you're adept, growing your wealth incrementally over time. And, and certainly we all want to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, but that should not drive the way you invest your money. Okay, so what should and this brings us to point number two never invest in anything that you do not understand since the explosion of investing uh, which has been with us for some time but I, I think has gained tremendous momentum since the inception of retail investing with online applications like Robinhood and other trading platforms that make it very easy for everybody to throw money at the market people ask me all the time, which cryptocurrencies do I like, what stocks do I like, so forth and so on. And, and I always respond reflexively with the following. Do you know anything about this asset? Do you know anything about this sector or this space? And if they don't, I say, well, then you should invest in it. If you do not have some degree of expertise or understanding, 
some degree of investment academically or otherwise in terms of understanding what you're investing in, it becomes very dangerous. What you, what you need to understand, whether it's cryptocurrencies or it's pharmaceutical companies or it's starting a small business and buying a car or a house, whatever, the more knowledge you have, the more powerful and the more effective you will be as an investor. And that is particularly the case when it comes to volatile financial assets. And remember that no matter how much insight or understanding you have of a particular asset, it does not preclude that asset from moving against you. But the more you know about it, the more confident you can be in your investing. Remember something that uh, Benjamin Graham says in The Intelligent Investor, he says you need to invest with patience and confidence. Confidence is born of experience, it's born of understanding, it's born of diligence with respect to the assets that you own. So number one, play defense, not offense. Number two, know what you're holding. Understand the asset first, then begin the process of investing. And that brings me to number three, which is to concentrate your investments in the things that you know. The age of passively allocating money to the stock market, in my judgment, is over. And I'll get into more of that in just a moment. But for mo most people, uh, investing is a very overwhelming experience. And so they simply defer to a financial advisor or somebody else that they have some degree of trust in. They're lazy about it. If you're lazy about it, your results are just not going to be very good. All people need to understand finance. For some, it's interesting. For most, it's probably not. It, it does not alleviate you of the responsibility of understanding these things on your own. And you're going to have to devote some degree of time to doing so. The more time you devote to it, the more effective that you'll be, the more confident you'll be, the more patient you can be with growing your investment over time. The fourth principle is, when in doubt, stay in cash. There's a, a saying in finance, cash is trash. It's become very popular to say, I, I think especially over the last decade or so, but in my judgment, it is completely wrong-headed. If you don't know what to do with your money, if you're not confident in investing in a particular asset or a sector, if you just don't have a strong sense of what you're doing, keep your money in cash wait for opportunities to present themselves. And that may mean that you miss out on surges that happen in the market. That's okay. The, the key is to save your money and grow your wealth over time. And that may mean for long stretches that you keep your money in cash before you see an opportunity that makes sense. And I'm going to give you a personal anecdote on this. When I got into tech in 2014-2015, uh, I was encouraged on a year-over-year -year basis to get into the stock market. People said, oh, you're missing out. And what I did instead is I put almost 50% of my income in savings during that period of time. None of it went into the stock market. And the reason is I simply didn't have the time to devote to understanding stocks and bonds and uh, the movement of, of different assets and, and to concentrate on specific companies or equities or assets that I thought were interesting. So I just kept it in cash. Well, lo and behold, that process accumulated over years and years and years. And sure enough, 2020 came along. We had a massive crash in the stock market and I was well equipped to take advantage of that because unlike a lot of people who were overly exposed to the market, I was in cash. And I was just sitting there waiting for an opportunity. And opportunities almost always come. Crashes disruptions, corrections in the marketplace are a consistent theme. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The market is going to do all kinds of things. It is not simply going to go up and up and up and up and up. It certainly doesn't do that monotonically or in a straight line. So if you don't know what to do, save your income and stay in cash. And a good target, I think, for all of us is to hit $10,000 in savings if you can. That may sound like an astronomical amount of money depending on on where you are, what stage of life you're in. But that is an appropriate benchmark, I think, to try and hit, to hedge against all kinds of problems that you may have and to give you enough ammunition if and when the circumstance emerges for you to take advantage of an opportunity. Okay, number, fifth, number five, 
Timing the market is crucial. And this, this is, a, I think, a, a direct contradiction to what is conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom today, especially in the United States, is that timing the market is inferior to time in the market. Well, as I said, uh, the markets are going to be dynamic and volatile at any given time. They're going to move in different directions on any given day or year. People ha have said for years that, that the way to defeat that volatility is to dollar cost average or to add a bit of your income over time, over long stretches of time, and eventually to see your income compound. Now that strategy can work if you understand the asset that you're investing in, uh, if, if uh, you're in a particular phase of the market that is bullish. And we'll address that more in just a moment. However, if you ignore cyclicality, if you ignore peaks and troughs in uh, a, a given asset class, then that could come at your detriment. And, and I'm going to give you an example here that goes back to, to my own family. My family was uh, reasonably wealthy going into the Great Depression, and they lost a substantial amount of their wealth during that, during that event, as did millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans, because they were overly exposed to financial markets. Well, it took the stock market 20 years to recover its losses from 1929, uh, basically until the 1950s. Warren Buffett, who is inarguably the most famous and, and probably successful value investors in the history of finance, he got into the stock market in the 1950s. That was the beginning of a massive bull run. So getting in at the right time is crucial. Now, how do you know when to get in? Well, if you know the assets that you're interested in, or if you're concentrated or focused on specific investments that, that you know well, that will to some degree give you some context for when it's overvalued or undervalued. That's one way. Another is to pay attention to cycles, to pay attention to mania and speculative explosions in the market. When everybody is buying, that's probably not a good idea to buy. When everybody is selling, that's probably a good idea to consider allocation. And like I said, those events happen more frequently than we're told to believe. So if you practice saving, if you practice staying in cash when you don't really know what else to do, uh, that's going to afford you opportunities when those disruptions come, provided you've done the homework on the assets you, you care to invest in. So pay attention to the cycles, pay attention to the peaks and troughs in investment euphoria, and gain an advanced understanding of the things that, that you're really interested in so that you can invest appropriately. I mean, number six, and this is the, the final principle for, for this video, transition. So why do I think we're in a transition? Well, it, it's not just about long-term cycles or hundred-year demarcations or fractals, if you will, you know, certain relationships that financial markets seem to express over time. It's largely because the world right now is experiencing meteoric growth in debt. It is not, at the same time, growing economically, meteorically, which means something's got to give. This is precisely why the housing market collapsed when it did. Eventually, people's incomes failed to keep track with the rise of housing prices. Now, that did not happen right away. But if you acted prematurely to exit the housing market or to hedge against a disaster because you recognize that there was a tremendous imbalance between average income levels and housing prices and valuations, then you protected yourself. And that may mean that you're wrong for years, but it means that when that disruption comes, you're not going to be wiped out. Right now, at every level of the economic structure globally and locally, Institutions, corporations, small businesses, households, governments are broke. All of them are broke, which means that the fragility of these systems is at all-time highs, which means that even incremental changes or disruptions could bring down the entire system. So we need to hedge against this as best as possible, unlike other people who assume, and, and this is a, a point I'm going to elaborate on in just a moment, that the authorities will ultimately come to the rescue. Whenever I have these conversations, people will 
revert to authority bias. They'll say, well, the Fed will step in. Well, governments will shore up the economy, worst case scenario. Ladies and gentlemen, that is simply not supported by the historical record. And it makes sense, right? Because if governments are going bankrupt, if they can't finance themselves, um, obviously they put themselves in this position. So that suggests by itself that they're not really prepared for the, the fragility that they've created, okay? In other words, they've engineered their own self-destruction. Why would you assume that an institution that has put itself in harm's way is uh, capable of rescuing itself, and yet people do because of authority bias? When you get these transitional moments in time, it's important to recognize that older paradigms break down. So there's just a few things, a uh, few, few different assumptions or pearls of, of conventional wisdom that I think are very dangerous and embedded in people's minds right now. One is passive investing. I mentioned that a moment ago. When you get cyclical changes or major permutations in financial markets, that usually undermines centralized systems. What, are, what, what is passive investing? It's basically putting your money with large institutions like BlackRock or Vanguard and assuming that because they're large and they're big and they've been around a while that they're safe. But when you get these cyclical changes, centralized systems become particularly dangerous. So passive investing is something you should be skeptical of, especially now. Another is diversification. Diversification is, is a, a way for people to obviate responsibility for taking ownership of their own investments. Oh, I'm just going to give it to Vanguard. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give my money to a mutual fund and let them handle the, uh, the diversification. The problem is when you're doing that, you're assuming that these institutions uh, can properly hedge against these cyclical events. And as I said, groupthink, conventional wisdom, the decline of these, these uh, corporate structures over time um, mitigates or, or rather suggests that they're going to make big mistakes. So now is not the time to entrust your fortune to some of these corporate structures that are embedded in an unsustainable system. Another is real estate flipping. So part of what enabled the 2008 crisis, as I mentioned, is the assumption that housing prices only go in one direction. By the way, the same mentality is what fueled the Great Depression and the stock market crash in 1929. The assumption was that the stock market only went in one direction. And by the way, that was not an assumption made solely by average investors. It was made by governments. It was made by Treasury secretaries. In fact, I think the Treasury Secretary of the United States under Hoover uh, in the lead up to the Depression, a man named Andrew Mellon, said, uh, we are in unbroken and unbreakable prosperity. And he was talking about the stock market. The stock market only goes in one direction. Don't you know that? Well, of course. That's not the way these things go. So housing prices do not only go in one direction. So you can't just buy homes, hold on to that asset for the rest of your life and assume that you're going to be okay. The same thing is true with your 401ks or your banks. You know, people assume that the FDIC will be there to rescue them. When you get these major apocal cyclical changes, centralized systems become unreliable. Okay, so just to, to, button up the, to button up the video, I, I want to mention a guy named Robert Prechter. Robert Prechter wrote a very important book that I recommend everybody read. It's called Conquer the Crash. Um, this book has been around for a while, but Robert Prechter, in, in my judgment, is a very savvy investor. He's written a lot of interesting books, but at a minimum, that book can help prepare you for what is to come. Robert Prechter uh, is a thinker who has put forth an idea called potent director assumption. Potent director assumption basically means that elites can control outcomes, that the Federal Reserve or the, uh, the Treasury Department or central banks around the world or governments or corporations um, have the competency and the power to mitigate against market disasters. Well, that's not really true, all right? Um, market disasters, they come and they go. There isn't a whole lot that can forestall them. And when you reach these levels of indebtedness, it suggests to me that uh, we are imperiled on, uh, to a degree that I, I just don't think a lot of people realize today. So this reaffirms what I said earlier. Centralized systems are, are in much 
more danger than I think people realize. And so try to avoid this potent director assumption, or you might say authority bias. The idea, again, that, that the authorities will rescue you. I would not assume that under any circumstances. I want to finish by mentioning a couple other books that I think are very important and can help you a great deal navigate through these difficult times. Uh, one is The Misbehavior of Markets. Now, The Misbehavior of Markets, in keeping with uh, the, the theme of unpredictability and chaos in financial markets, argues that part of the problem of finance is that it assumes that catastrophic events are rare and anomalous. The, the truth is that they simply aren't, and they aren't because human behavior can be erratic, and it can be consistently erratic. It doesn't mean, as uh, they point out in the book, that markets are completely illogical, that, that there's no pattern to them at all. It does, however, mean that they're very unpredictable and that markets can move in directions that you think are impossible at any given time. So again, err on the side of safety. If you need to keep all your investments in cash, there's no harm in doing so. Let other people take the dive. And if you miss out on rallies on the way up, that's fine. Exercise patient, patience, wait for that entry point, okay? If you, if you get in at the wrong time and, and, and get wiped out, it, it's going to imperil your investment future. It doesn't matter whether you're 20 or whether you're 50. So try to avoid falling prey to fear of missing out, to mania and groupthink. The final, uh, the final book that I'll recommend is called A Short History of Financial Euphoria, written by John Kenneth Galbraith. This is an excellent book because it does, it does a, a good job of demonstrating I think the, the continuity of financial markets over long periods of time, and that is to say that there isn't a whole lot of mystery to why financial markets collapse. They collapse for the same reasons almost every time. It's leverage, you know, borrowing on margin to invest in assets that you think can't crash, and it's, uh, it's irresponsible mania, um, euphoria, and pessimism or shifts in psychology and mass that move markets back and forth. The introduction of artificial intelligence, uh, advanced monetary policy practiced by the Federal Reserve, government spending, you know, fiscal dominance, none of these things, as sophisticated as we may think, overcome human nature. If people panic, if they want to get out of a financial uh, system or market, if they want to sell stocks, if they panic and want to sell bonds, it doesn't matter what the authorities do. They don't have the tools. They don't have the power to control human psychology. And that's why financial crises happen. Hopefully this was helpful. Stay tuned for more, and we'll talk soon.